Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much indeed <clears throat> for inviting me. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone here. What I'd like to do is, could I encourage us to have a little more light in here as well? Because what I'm going to do is um, convene here a, a brainstorming on Ukraine. Many of you will have ideas, and I'd like to be able to see who you are um, when you want to intervene. So whoever's got the finger on the light, could you possibly put it to a little higher than it is at the moment. Oh, yeah. Now, what you heard um, from Duncan earlier on about Spot Me is not just a gimmick, it's actually important. So 126 of you have signed up, and given the number of people here, thanks for the light, given the number of people here, um, it's a way of you putting onto the agenda ideas, issues, questions, and um, I can convene it. Could I encourage those of you who want to have conversations to move out of the room, please? <laughs> I'm told I'm going to be a tough moderator. Can I force you out of the room in that case? <laughs> we're running a bit over at the moment, so we're going to let this extend um, well beyond 3 o'clock. There are so many critical issues here about Ukraine. Let me just give you um, a personal note, if I could. Um, I haven't just flown in from London today, um, and this is being my first time in Bratislava. I was first here during the darkest days of communism. And for me, uh, it's wonderful to be able to drive straight from Vienna into Bratislava without having to stop at that pink border post where they wouldn't let me in, even if I had a visa. And I was dur here during the Velvet Revolution, and I was up at the castle when Mechar and Havel divided up Czechoslovakia into two states. So for someone like me, hearing from the minister, the ministers about um, what the uh, achievements are of Visegrad uh, and the way this region is moving, is so critical, and uh, one couldn't have imagined it in the middle of the 80s when I was an accredited correspondent, and it was a hopeless task uh, being a, a correspondent then. But now we have uh, Ukraine. And again, could I ask you to keep the noise down if you're having private conversations? There's plenty of coffee and water and other things outside, because I really do want to focus this on a, on a spirit of brainstorming and send those ideas in now, please. I can get them on my machine. I might come to you and ask you to give me an idea of what your thought is uh, about what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, but it's difficult to follow, said the Deputy Prime Minister, let alone manage how to de-escalate it. I think one thing we can say at the moment, it could be a lot worse. Uh, that's uh, really, really uncomfortable. But remember what uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister said. We've had a wake-up call. We were too complacent. We took too much for granted. And that has to underpin where we are at the moment. And at this moment in Kiev, a round table is being convened to try to hear as many voices as possible, not every voice, um, of what is happening uh, in the country and the way forward. Could it be peaceful? Can it be de-escalated? We'll hear more about that later, literally, uh, as we're gathered here uh, in Slovakia. Could we put the lights up again, please? Lights, please. Um, secondly, the, the paradox. Seven Ukrainian soldiers killed yesterday uh, by uh, RPGs in an ambush. At the same time, this roundtable debate uh, going on. Warnings of a civil war. But it is a, a low-level conflict at the moment, fortunately. But I want to introduce into this discussion at this stage uh, what has been said by the interim uh, interior minister. And he said yesterday, this is now an information war quote, that they are waging against us. It's more dangerous than a bullet. We must answer back. The enemy fears this more than special forces. This is now, therefore, broadened considerably. And what we want to do is explore where we are today, where it might go in the future, and the future is tomorrow and the day after, quite apart from where we may be in several weeks and months. And what are the opportunities are? What does President Putin mean when he says he respects the referendum results last weekend. Let's get some insight on that. Um, what is the nature of the Russian separatist demand at the moment? How deep is it? What are the political options to handle it now? Eastern Ukraine is not Crimea. Different realities. Are sanctions on 70 leading figures in Russia beginning to have their own impact because of uh, the way the president responded at the weekend to these uh, ad hoc referendums? And um, if this is now the post post-Cold War, what are the normative new realities that all of you and everyone in this region and beyond now has to face? And certainly for me, um, it is this, this reality 
that the way uh, assumptions and calculations and assessments and, an, and, and analyses were made um, in the previous weeks are almost for the dustbin compared to the new realities faced. I was at the British Foreign Office yesterday, and there was an absolute confirmation of how difficult it was to really understand uh, what was being intended uh, from Moscow. So uh, we need to re-examine assumptions. We're going to run beyond uh, 3 o'clock, uh, I hope. Uh, and what I hope as well is that we do have a voice from Moscow, even though official invitations uh, were not uh, given a positive response from Moscow. Can I check, Dmitry Trenin, yes. director of the Carnegie Center, are you out there in Moscow? Yes. Dmitry, it's nice to hear you. I can't see you yet, but I would like you to feel you can enter this discussion uh, at any point uh, here in Bratislava. Are you still there, Dmitry? <laughs> All right, that's a redial, but at least we know he's there. But I want you to know that we do... We do have a voice there uh, in Moscow, and that's important to, uh, to, to balance the arguments and the discussion here. In addition to uh, Minister Martinu, who we've just been hearing from, uh, we have Foreign Minister uh, Rinkevich uh, from, R from Latvia. Uh, we also have Timothy Snyder. Tim, welcome. Good I haven't you. been able to see you because you got stuck in traffic, but welcome. Uh, not least because of the work that you were doing about the reconstruction, your your analyses of the reconstruction of Poland, of Ukraine, up to 1999. Therefore, the historical context and the analysis that you were able to put into it. And uh, Oled Rypatschuk, who is chairman and co-founder uh, of the Center UA from Kiev. He's been in banking, he's been in the finance industry, but he's also a leading figure in politics in Kiev. And we last met three weeks ago um, in Tallinn, examining the same things, but so much has changed in that time. Please remember to use your pad in front of you to help us focus this discussion, please. Dimitri, are you there still? All right, I tell you what, John, you tell me when he's there, and then I'll know when, whether to go to him. Um, let me first of all ask each of you for a, a short, sharp assessment, please. <coughs> Minister, we've just heard from you. Let me go to Minister Rinkevich. What is your assessment of how things are moving at the moment on Ukraine. To contribute to this brainstorming, you had an, a Foreign Affairs Council in Brussels just two days ago. Well, I think that what we have is certainly still Ukraine under attack, and it's um, Europe waking up, as uh, I believe Mr. Roger has said to that. And what we have seen is a mix of good and bad news. We see that uh, OEC is yes, well, thank you. prepared, has been endorsed also by Russia to some extent. At the same time, we see that things on the Thank ground you. really do not change very much. So I have a feeling that we here are in a position where uh, still we are talking, but still things are not moving in the right direction. What is the right direction? Uh, in my mind, the right direction would be that uh, we could have, uh, first of all, presidential elections uh, held in all Ukraine. Operations are well underway, and second, of course, that all those separatist groups that are currently in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, would stop fighting, and we would get some kind of political dialogue, including uh, all regions, all parties in Ukraine. So we haven't seen that. Uh, plus, of course, uh, withdrawal of Russian troops from the Ukrainian border that has been claimed by Russia is happening, but uh, we do not see real proof of that. So that would be my description for a short time moment, what is right thing or right uh, direction. Because already a, a thought here from Todd Lindbergh, uh, what does success in Ukraine really look like from here? Is success the same for Kiev as for the European Union and the US? Well, you know, the success, the full success would be return of Crimea to Ukraine, uh, stabilization of country politically, economically, and uh, their own decision, Ukrainian decision, uh, what kind of future they do want. But this is, of course, uh, a little bit uh, a dream currently. So I would stick to the success where we have a certain political process, uh, elections, as I said, uh, upcoming elections as a first step, a political dialogue, economic reform, and here, of course, the deal can come. However, however, it's going to be very, very difficult. Minister Martin, the same questions to you, a success. What's your feeling of where we are today, particularly bearing in mind the FAC in Brussels on Monday? 
Well, uh, um, if you permit me a general remark, because I just would like to reflect briefly upon what has been said before. Uh, I was sitting here on the same chair one year ago. And we were discussing uh, whether Easter partnership could become a win-win game or not. And we tried to explain why it should become a win-win game and it should not be a zero-sum game. And there was an understanding that we should do everything uh, so that be the case. Uh, now, it's not the case, clearly. And the real issue is that we do not uh, know exactly what the objectives uh, of, uh, of Russia are. And well, let's uh, move on to that in a moment specifically, but do you have clarity in your mind or not? I do not have a clarity on my mind because I still do not understand the objectives of the, of the other side. And that's why I just try to refer to this, that we have a high degree of uncertainty and unpredictability even as far as uh, uh, developments uh, this afternoon, because as you rightly said, the uh, National Roundtable discussion just started half an hour ago. And we do not even know exactly who the participants are. Uh, and we uh, know even less uh, what will be the outcome of this afternoon or tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. We do not know uh, what will happen in uh, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. Uh, we do not know how the roadmap, uh, which is, I believe, a very good one of OSCE, uh, will work. There was, by the way, general understanding uh, uh, in, the general affairs council, uh, I mean, in the Foreign Affairs Council on Monday to support uh, the OSCE roadmap, which is a good one. And the first point is stop the violence. Now, we do not know if uh, violence has been stopped. It was not. In reality, uh, interesting things uh, that peaceful demonstrations uh, still seem to use uh, the most sophisticated uh, uh, weapons. Somehow they manage to uh, uh, manufacture them. Uh, so uh, uh, violence is still going on. And that's why I believe that what we need to present now is a firmness and unity. And much has been said, for instance, about divergences among the 28 member states uh, uh, of European Union with respect to sanctions, restrictive measures, and so on and so on. But we always manage to come to a common conclusion. And that's exactly what happened on Monday, two days ago. We have common conclusions, and we maintain a unity uh, which, will, uh, which we will never give up. I mean, that's the main point here, that we have to have a strong stance and uh, clearly, we have to uh, insist to some of the basic principles, because it's not only about the Ukraine. It's not only about uh, the region. It's about the global world order, about the basic rules and principles, how that global order functions, whether we abide by fundamental international obligations and laws or not. That is what is at stake here. And that's, I believe, uh, uh, makes us all directly concerned in this. Minister, story. thank you. Let uh, Dimitri, can you hear me now? Uh, are you up on Skype at the moment? All right, Dimitri. I hope you're hearing the discussion going on. Uh, he all right, well, I will simply uh, just uh, rephrase what Minister Martineau has, has said, uh, which I think underpins everything in this discussion. What are the intent? What are the intentions of the other side, as the minister put it? Is there clarity from you in Moscow? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this can happen any day. <laughs> All right, well, we're not... We it, is there any other Rus Russian representative here in the, uh, in the audience who would like to... Any other delegate here who could maybe help uh, Minister uh, Martinu <laughs> understand what the intentions are of the other side? Yes, please. Could I get a microphone down here, please? Ah, uh, Dimitri. Dimitri, thank you for putting your jacket on. Are you ready to speak to me now? Uh, well, thank you for putting your jacket on. Um, does that improve the volume? Let me come to you, please. Mic microphone, please. So I cannot talk. Uh, 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 Could you introduce yourself? Please? Okay, my name is Andrei Larionov. I'm senior fellow at the Kate Institute, 
and I spent about yes. six years as a chief economic advisor to Mr. Putin in early year 2000s. So I'm not in a position to speak on behalf of the Russian government and Russian authorities right now, and I am not in charge of it, but it seems to me I have some cl clarity about what is the plan. And actually it's necessary to read and to listen to Mr. Putin and to his friends all these days, and at least for last year. Uh, what we're dealing right now is not Ukrainian crisis, it's not crisis in Ukraine, this is a Russian-Ukrainian war. To be correct, this is Mr. Putin's war against Ukraine. Uh, and this war is only one chapter in much larger uh, conflict that is being uh, launched on July 27, year 2013, by the speech of Mr. Putin in Kyiv. This is a, what is being called by uh, Russia propaganda people, Fourth World War. But can we go back to that question, what are the intentions at the moment? Uh, the main intention, not at the moment, but strategic, is to produce divide in the West between Anglo-Saxon world and continental Europe, to create alliance between Russia and continental Europe on one side against Anglo-Saxon world, meaning United States, United Kingdom, and uh, so-called front states, three Baltic countries and Poland. Is it going according to plan, in your view? At this moment goes everything perfectly. <laughs> Fine, everything going perfectly. Um, Oleg, uh, what is your view from Kiev? No doubt you'd like to be at the round table, but what is your view about particularly the operations in eastern Ukraine, whether for the interim government to have done this is the correct thing to do and is going to work? Um. And the way is not very typical Russian voice. But here I mostly agree with what was here saying. In my opinion, uh, Mr. Putin's plan as a blitzkrieg in Ukraine uh, actually collapsed. He, not because the uh, Ukrainian government was very efficient, but because he miscalculated with the uh, feelings of, of the nation. He never understood. The people can never believe people can somehow went into the street without West paying per second for them being in that street. He never believed that, that, that. Therefore, he believed that he would be welcomed by half of the nation and he would be having nice Ukrainian girls welcoming him with uh, bread and salt. And obviously, here he mis miscalculated. Instead of having 12 regions on fire, he has one and a half region where separatists just migrate between, not actually separatists, but uh, special operations plus their aides migrate between a couple of small Ukrainian towns in Donetsk and Luhansk area. So I would say that since we met last time, from my point of view, the importance of letter U in our common alphabet has really increased. U meaning unity. United Europe is extremely important. And United Unified Ukraine is very important as well. What United Europe, I, I support minister absolutely here. This morning I got wake up call, it's four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock I was watching as normal Ukrainians, five o'clock in the morning, I was new good news. And there was, uh, a journalist was talking to one of EU freedoms uh, leaders, freedoms party leaders, uh, 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 as a part of uh, uh, elections campaign to European Parliament. And obviously the, the guy was uh, labeled like Eurosceptic, and uh, the journalist asked him, what will you do if you get, not majority, but if you get considerable part of European Parliament? His imminent response was, uh, we should like Europe to come back to just economic uh, market, no political union. And for me, it means actually a dream of Mr. Putin, because if you don't have unified policies, you will never get a simple economic market. We, we perfectly understand that. And unity for Ukraine is extremely important. Right now, maybe in two minutes, we are supposed to start first national round table of unity where ex-presidents of Ukraine or all uh, leaders of political parties, public opinion, church, you name it, uh, under auspices of United of OEC, they are having the first round table uh, in Ukrainian parliament. I. I'm absolutely positive, if Europe is united and Ukraine, Ukraine is united, we have a promising uh, future. And uh, here we are thinking alike. This is the only answer to, to Mr. Putin's dreams. Oleg, but my question was your view of what, is, what the, uh, the interim government is trying to do in eastern Ukraine at the moment as a military and security operation. 
Oh, it's very limited, it's overstatement that it's Eastern Europe, it's just two regions where we do have uh, paramilitary troops involved. In all other 10 regions, we have just volunteers and police. No anti-terrorist operations. Anti-terrorist operations is focused in two regions, and what they actually do, they try to isolate enclaves of uh, Russian troops and terrorists, not to allow them to go outside of that circle. Till this moment, they are acting more or less uh, successfully. They don't allow this conflict to go beyond uh, these two regions. Do you believe it's the right thing to be doing? The right thing to be doing is to have elections. And uh, the right thing to be doing is to address the need... Yeah, but my question is, do you believe, given that there could be a spark which leads to something much more serious <coughs> in a military confrontation, a limited military confrontation at the moment, do you believe it's the right thing to be doing? To respond with, uh, well, to shoot when you are being shot at, I do believe that. Because lots of Ukrainians now believe the situation in Crimea could be very, very different if Mr. Putin, from the very beginning, would get that feeling that don't cross the lines, because if you shoot, they can shoot at you. All right. So-called peaceful thing in, in, in Crimea sent very wrong signal to Mr. Putin. Tim Snyder, uh, you wrote uh, about uh, the reconstruction of nations, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, up to 1999. What do you believe is taking place now, particularly for Ukraine? Well, the reconstruction takes place at a number of different levels. The main thesis of the book that you're so kind to refer to is that nations are remade from the past. And one of the things that we are witnessing in the background, but it's an important background, is the reconstruction of Ukrainian identity. Interestingly, opinion polls show precisely as a result of Crimea and the Russian intervention in the East that more and more people are unambiguous about their Ukrainian identity. Not in the West and the center, we can take it for granted, but also in the East. Interestingly enough, if you want to meet a newly minted, unambiguous, fervent Ukrainian nationalist, you're much more likely to find him today in Luhansk or in Donetsk than you are in Ternopil or Lviv. Because these are the people who have a recent, new, shocking experience. So there's been a kind of disambiguation of Ukrainian identity as a result of this. And that's, a, that's happened in the last few months, but it may be the most significant thing in, in the long run. The other thing that I was trying to claim in that book, The Reconstruction of Nations, is that success as a nation state opens the way into Europe. And I think this is, and that was the happy story of Poland's relations with its eastern neighbors in Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. By avoiding border conflicts over Vilnius or Lviv or, or Grodno, Poland was able to make sure that it could move west. Now that whole story has moved one country over. It's the eastern border of Ukraine which now becomes the, the mental, the emotional, the moral border of Europe. And it's the place where border conflicts have to be settled for, for Europe to expand. But the question goes deeper than that. The question goes to the question of whether you actually have a legal order which is, which is enforceable at all. Because, and now I'm, now I'm restating but in a slightly different way. Ukraine is not, the conflict in Ukraine is not about Ukraine. The conflict in Ukraine is a test case for Europe. If the things that can be made to work in Ukraine can be made to work on a larger scale, then the European Union ceases to function. So the whole story has to be told in a way backwards. What has happened is not, I don't think, mainly a war on Ukraine or an assault on Ukraine. What happened was that the Ukrainians on the Maidan were the first people who resisted a countervision to the European Union. There is now a countervision out there. I mean, Europeans are used to thinking, we only have one vision, we are innocent, and everyone likes us, right? But since the middle of 2013, there has been a countervision. It goes under the name of Eurasia. It pretends to be a trade agreement. In fact, it is a cultural, ideological, and political challenge whose ultimate aim is to fragment and destroy the European Union leave the European Union as a bunch of nation states, which will never have a common energy policy, which is the crucial thing, and which can be easily manipulated by Russia. That crashed in December 2013 and January 2014 on the Maidan. The Ukrainians in Kiev were the first people who resisted this notion. This was a wake-up call for Europe, but I would also argue that it was, part of, it, was, it was the first stage in a general struggle. And as has already been pointed out, it was a stage which did not end the way the Russians expected. So now we find ourselves fully engaged in a much larger conflict, which is going faster than anyone expected, including people in Moscow. 
Do you believe you may one day have to be writing about the destruction of Ukraine? No, I, 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 I don't believe that. I mean, historians are often wrong about the present and the future. We specialize in that when we're not being wrong about the past. But um, <laughs> the, I, I do not think that's what's going to happen. On, on the contrary, I, I think that the, the, even in Russia, people are now realizing that Ukrainian identity is more robust than was expected. And the, ver the problems with the Ukrainian state um, so even the even the very basic ones having to do with um, with the militia are now being addressed because they have to be addressed. I, I, I won't I can't say with confidence what form the Ukrainian state is going to be, but I, I do not now expect that the Ukrainian state is, is is not going to be a subject of international law in in the future. What I would say is that the question you're asking is simultaneously a question about Europe. I do think that the European, it's not an exaggeration to say that the European order now hangs in Ukraine the same way that the European order of the 1930s ha hung in the Sudetenland or in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> if there is no Ukraine, that means there will be no more Europe. And we will not be asking, is there a Ukraine? We'll be asking what happened to our beautiful, peaceful, prosperous post-war European order. All right, well, let me move it on, including the ministers and Oleg here. Do you envisage that there may be a Ukraine at some point in the foreseeable future, which is a federation of 25 oblasts as opposed to one sovereign state in, as it's currently constituted. Would you accept that, Minister? Well, there's one point I would like to express my full agreement, and this is that the Ukrainian national identity has become much, much, much stronger because of the uh, last month's uh, development. So that's why I tried to provoke with my question what the objectives of uh, Russia are, because clearly uh, I don't believe that this uh, would have been one of their objectives, to strengthen Ukrainian national identity, and that's exactly what happened. So whatever the future constitutional structure uh, of the Ukraine uh, will be, Ukraine is here to stay. But the Federation the question, idea, Minister, do you think that there, would, there could be a pragmatic acceptance that I that is a way forward? I wouldn't be obsessed by words. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I know what the legal words mean, but I also know what the economic and sociological uh, reality means. So uh, let's try to find a solution which is acceptable for everyone, and let's try thereby uh, to save and strengthen the state of Ukraine, whether confederal, whether federal, whether whatever. In any case, the word what we use now, and I would also suggest to use, is the word decentralization. And that's what, uh, that's what we use now, and I think that's correct. Yes, and sir. how we, you will term it later on, historians or legal scholars will term it after 50 years, that's a different question. But we are all interested in the existence of the Ukraine. And I'm saying this because in 91 December, when we first landed uh, in Kiev with the dead time prime minister and met the first Ukrainian leadership, that was the question. Everybody asked from us, do you think Ukraine will survive? Ukraine did survive. And our basic objective and interest now in a European context as well, is that indeed uh, Ukraine continues to exist. And the Russians, they still have not decided whether they would like to have Ukraine as a whole or they would like to prefer a partition and they would prefer having some of the eastern provinces by whatever means right, they well, come let, to their end. Let, let, me, let me ask Minister Vrinkevich as well the same, the same question about a federation. Well, I'm not a lawyer so I can be a little bit careless here but... Uh, <laughs> In my opinion, uh, of course, it's up to Ukraine to decide. However, I do not believe that uh, Ukraine is going to opt for federation. From our own Baltic experience, I can say that if Russia really gets pressure on something, then at least uh, our history has shown, our 24 years history of regained independence shows that uh, we are less inclined to follow such kind of pressure. And I believe that Ukraine is actually getting the same kind of uh, experience. But of course, uh, it's... Uh, up to Ukrainians to decide how to govern their own country. Oleg. Yeah, we, we fully, uh, we, we now, the, we change the issue actually, like they say, in this course, uh, we are speaking about decentralization. And this is, uh, becomes more and more popular. I had very funny experience uh, with talking to, in Odessa, to uh, strong supporters of federalization, pro-Russist, uh, on, their, on their camp there. Uh, I asked them, what do you want? They say, we would like to have more say. We don't want somebody from Kiev to dictate. We would like to have all our finances here. We would like to have federation. I said, okay, 
Is Russia a federation? They say, yes, yeah, sure, Russia is a federation. Who takes decision in Russia? <laughs> and then I saw the guy start slowly thinking. Do you like, would like to have the system like in Russia? No, no, he says. So it's, it's, it's just really very messy. But decentralization, they understand. Would you, what do you think, Tim, on, on a federation? Uh, look, it, 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 as has already been pointed out, the word federation can contain all kinds of different okay. content. Normally, federations are formed when there are already federal units like with traditions, yeah. like in the United States or, or Germany, Switzerland or Germany, Germany mm -hmm. where you have you know a state or a land and that form and that, which pre-exists and has its own law, and then you form a larger unit. It's it's unusual to take a centralized state and then create a federation from it. I think the word has become somewhat toxic because it's, it's in the Russian reading, a federation is something which has its own foreign regional foreign policies or can block foreign policy. Whereas in general, again, even in federations like the United States, foreign, foreign policy and military decisions are taken at the central level. So the word, I think, has become itself very problematic. That you could have administrative decentralization where matters having to do with language are decided at the regional level, um, where matters having to do with culture or decide at the regional level where you agree that some percentage of budget is going to stay in, you know, which is interesting because then you find out who's actually paying into the central budget and who's not, right? In the Ukraine, as in the United States, the people who think they're paying more are generally the people who are actually getting more from the central budget. So when you make these rules, then you figure out who's actually paying in and who's getting out. That, I think, is all legitimately on the table, um, but that's not the same thing as a, as, as a federation. I think the question is on what scale you're going to do the decentralization. Scale of de decentralization. Does anyone want to come in on, on, uh, with insight on this particular issue? I've got a whole bundle of other areas like sanctions, which I can move on to very quickly. But uh, if you do want to come, out, come back, please do. Uh, tell, yes, a microphone over here. Is that Heather? Heather Gravy. Um, let me give you an idea uh, of, of what is being said as well about uh, sanctions. And one question here from Ian Bond. Do we really know what our objectives are? Um, are we too reactive instead of defining what we want and the means to get it. Bear that in mind, Heather. Uh, Heather Gravy from Open Society. I just wanted to comment on, on this question of regionalism and federalism because in the EU it sounds very benign. It's something that the EU has always promoted. Uh, in a way, uh, respect for minority rights, for example, has often gone hand in hand with uh, regionalization, more autonomy to regions. So I think there's a big risk that in the EU people don't take uh, this, this as the, the toxic nature of, of the proposals that have been put forward, especially on the Russian side, uh, seriously enough. Um, and also the fact that people seem to have forgotten that Ukraine had a constitution writing cr um, process, that in fact Ukraine has been through a long period of nation making, which actually included many of these issues being discussed. When not, this is not 1991, but the, the, the progress that's actually been made over the past 20 years in Ukraine, also on issues like minority rights, so things are not perfect, but a lot of that is just now being forgotten. As, it's as if we're, we're just starting again. And I, I hope that people on the EU side will read a bit more history uh, before uh, taking on board all of the propaganda. Heather, before I ask the ministers, do you, sitting in Brussels, think that there is clarity uh, from the European Union and the international community of what objectives should now be in Ukraine? I think there's very little clarity, as we saw from the General Affairs Council discussion. Um, at the moment, the member states are having huge internal struggles. Each country is trying to come with a, with a view. I think we're seeing here, represented at Globsec, um, some very clear views, uh, because the countries uh, which joined the EU in 2004 in particular uh, have a very uh, clear sense of, of what it means to have sovereignty, and, and also they have their own uh, concerns and interests in Russia. What's much less clear is uh, the countries with, with where energy is still a very contentious issue. Um, and I think Germany is the key. Where will Germany end up on this? We hear different things from different people in the government. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be very interested in the views of the panel on where they think Germany will come out on all of this. On objectives and clarity. I just uh, wanted to address the federalism question here. And uh, Andrew Mikta, Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington. And go to what I think Tim has touched on, which is very important here. I'm actually wondering if I'm the only one in this room who is concerned about the fact that we are debating the issue of federalism, uh, where in fact it has not been put on the agenda by Ukraine itself, but in fact by a neighboring country, and that we are now ready to debate whether or not we are dealing not just with uh, territorial integrity of a state, good old-fashioned aggression that's going to uh, you know, slice of a portion of somebody's country, but in fact, we are about to debate whether a neighboring state has the right 
to frame the constitutional order of a country that we believe, as far as I know, is still a sovereign state. And I find this extremely disturbing that if we buy into this debate, federalism or not federalism, we're stipulating Putin's primary assumption that in fact this is 18th century and he, like Catherine the Great, can say, I'm going to tell the Finns what kind of a structure they're going to have. I'm going to tell the Ukrainians what kind of a structure they, they will have. And we in the West, by engaging in this discussion, I would submit to you, are sanctioning it indirectly. Thank you. So it's, it's part of the discussion, though. Do you in the, in the European Union have a clarity now of objectives? Was there a clarity on Monday of what the objectives should be, both ministers? Mr. Rinkevich. OK. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, well, actually, it's a very interesting um, body, European Union. You have 28 nations, and uh, Ukraine is not the only issue we uh, have difficulty to agree immediately. And I think that we have many other things on the table we have discussion. But I think that where our uh, clarity um, was, and uh, we were all unanimous uh, discussing this, uh, on Monday is that, uh, first of all, we want to see OEC roadmap to succeed. I think that here we have seen this as uh, the point where we can agree. However, however, I have to also admit that uh, there are different views, of course, uh, within European Union, how we should uh, act. And of course, um, there has been a mentioning about Anglo-Saxon world and Pol Poland and Baltic states. I'm happy to be a part of Anglo-Saxon world in some respect, but uh, certainly we think that the EU could have acted uh, uh, stronger. However, I would also underscore that also for us, it is very important that EU acts uh, in unity and that there is no a situation where Baroness Ashton gets out of the room and says we don't have any decision because we disagreed. So in unity, but with clear objectives. That's Ian Bond's question. Are there really clear objectives now? I think that the clear objective is to get Ukraine back on stable development and to allow this country to choose its own destiny. It's a very broad objective. It's very easy to say. It's very difficult to achieve. But I think that we have some toolbox to assist here. So uh, first, to get uh, political stability. Second, to get economic reform going through assistance package we have provided. And then, of course, it's up to Ukraine then to decide where to go. Where we do have total disagreement uh, is uh, whether there is going to be European perspective to some countries of so-called Eastern right. Partnership. That's where, of course, we still are debating. Oleg, do you think this, uh, Minister, well, I, I, I see clear objectives? I yes. I see no difference whatsoever uh, in the field of the object objective. So if you read the Council conclusions, for instance, from Monday, it's quite clear. The first sentence is a sovereign, independent mm. Ukraine with territorial integrity. We condemn the Crimean annexation and so on and so on. So uh, I think on the objectives, uh, there is a full consensus. Of course, there are differences as far as the tools or the devices uh, or the practical policies are concerned. For instance, sanctions, that's the uh, often cited example. We'll come on to that in a moment. Of course, countries would be, would be diversely uh, affected in different uh, areas. But I think uh, for the objectives and for the basic values, and that's why we always underline them, uh, we fully agree. Oleg, do you think there's clarity from outside to assist whatever case is being made now in Kiev at this very moment? Much more that, than when I was Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration in 2005, when uh, we just signed action plan with EU, and that action plan was structured in such a way that you never know what is next? And my direct question to EU was, let's admit this horrible scenario, we implement everything, what is next? But the reality is so different now. It, yeah, now reality is shockingly different. So we clearly hear now that if Ukraine, we, we hear a number of, of very important signals that uh, this association agreement is not the end of our relationship, that this is just beginning of the process. We hear very clearly that if we implement, we'll, we'll be getting more for more. And uh, we hear for the first time that Europe is practically uh, singing in one voice. It's extremely important because I remember those days when Euro-Atlantic and European discussions, ministers of defense were meeting in two different groups. That was a horrible scenario for us because if the West is not united, uh, we are in very difficult position. 
Do you think there's clarity, Tim, or not? Look, it, it, at the level that we're talking about, there's an impressive amount of clarity. But the theme that you raised at the very beginning about the information war reveals, uh, w reveals levels of discussion where there is not clarity. The, 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 the Austrian or the German or the French public discussion, when you move away from, um, uh, with respect, foreign ministers and governments and down to newspapers, if you look at the way Le Figaro presents the, the conflict as opposed to the way that Le Monde presents the conflict, if you look at the way that, um, this has already been mentioned, but the way that the populist right is running its campaign um, in, through the European parliamentary elections on a pro-Russia platform, you realize that there is a good deal of dissonance in public opinion, and you realize that on the propaganda side of things, the Russians are, are, can count some very important successes. Reopening the question, as Andrew Mikta pointed out, of the structure of Ukraine has been and one success. Um, reopening the question of the nature of the European Union has been another success, and I think an allied success. So policy clarity, sure, and, 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 and chapeau bas, but in terms of uh, the, 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 the clashes that one sees in German public opinion, which is the most important case, there is a new level of unclarity and ambiguity and even strife over Russia and Ukraine. And Minister Rinkevich, I think there is an interesting awareness within the European Union about the information war. Uh, what came out of that, that meeting on, on Monday? Well, actually, there was a proposal which still has to be discussed, how we are addressing uh, this um, 21st century peculiarity, which is called information war, how we get our message to Russian public. Uh, I really don't believe it has to be like a Cold War Voice of America or, or all those radio stations we had. However, what uh, also I feel we need to address First of all, Russian public within European Union, and we have considerable that in almost every country now. We had our Bulgarian colleague and some other colleagues talking about that, but we also have to try to get our message in the best way possible also to uh, Russians in Russia itself. Because what we have seen, and if you watch Russian uh, media, I think that that kind of propaganda is surpassing everything one could even imagine back in Soviet Union. Yes, that is something we have to address. And we have uh, some of our colleagues proposing that. I think we will have some work further as well. Do keep the thoughts coming through, please. It's really very useful for me to know what's on your mind so I can move the direction of travel. Do I gather that Dimitri can't hear us? Is that the problem? He can't hear us. All right. Um, you might like to ask him if there's a way of doing this. Could I ask him um, uh, the, the question which I was asking before? Is it clear now what Russia is trying to do and its ambitions? If there's a way of somehow hearing from him in Moscow, John? All right. I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, sanctions. Uh, Robert Kandra, what specific steps should European states take on economic sanctions for the seizure and annexation of Crimea. And another question, given that Putin's popularity in Russia is exceptionally high, do you really believe economic sanctions should remain the preferred tool to influence or induce Russia to respond positively? Minister. Uh, well, the economic consequences are already there. So, uh, and uh, they are uh, serious. Uh, and it's also a question of what the political consequences of, uh, of this economic uh, deterioration uh, will be. Uh, investments, uh, even without introducing any additional uh, measures or legislation, investments uh, uh, in uh, Russia are uh, slowing down, which is perhaps an understatement. There is a serious capital flow, and the economic forecast uh, for this year in terms of growth is uh, basically zero. Uh, and for Russia, it could be a real issue. Now, on the other hand, if, for instance, uh, oil production and gas production uh, uh, on a global level uh, could be significantly increased and oil prices uh, could go down, uh, that would have a much, much more serious consequence upon uh, Russia's economy uh, and government than uh, these kind of uh, sanctions, uh, quote unquote, which have already been introduced in the so-called first and the second uh, phase. But we have to be uh, uh, aware of the fact uh, that the sanctions, uh, and especially counter-sanctions, bite uh, us as well. 
and in a very different uh, uh, measure. And that's why what we are saying also uh, among the 28, that in that case, uh, an equitable burden sharing and uh, solidarity would be indispensable. Also, we have to see that uh, different areas would have different m impact upon different uh, member states. Uh, finances, capital flows is one thing. Investment is another thing. Uh, energy is again another thing. So uh, uh, it's a very complex thing. European Commission is working on that, by the way. Uh, but all in all, what we really uh, would like to avoid uh, is a, an economic war because we would all suffer. And that's why all of us, we promote the dialogue and the national roundtable and uh, a political solution. Many of you, I'm sure, might have views on sanctions. Please put up your hand and let's get a microphone to you, please, on sanctions. Thank you. Marcin Terlikowski, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Well, I would offer one um, comment regarding the sanctions. Well, I feel that uh, this, when it comes to sanctions, the devil lies in the details, because here in this region, we are very much aware that sanctions and counter sanctions, like the minister said, can bite us, and we need, uh, we need solidarity because of the dependence on uh, on energy sources. But when you go to, to, to our Western partners of the European Union, you can hear that in some specific sectors, the dependence on Russia is, is huge. And I'm not speaking about only uh, London City and the, and the financing and the, and the money and the uh, financial uh, measures which are there. But I'm speaking about, for example, high-tech industry, which is utterly dependent on the rare earth materials and metals imported from Russia. And in such cases, uh, it will be very difficult to switch to alternative uh, vendors, which could be very often from China. Uh, and by speaking that, sometimes even local policy uh, comes into play. For, for example, one or two companies which are dependent on sales of systems, um, advanced systems, maybe uh, de de defense systems to Russia, uh, in case of a uh, halt of this kind of um, transaction, the whole company can uh, start uh, letting people off, what means that local policy comes into play and the local um, caucuses may influence uh, the decisions of central government. So the devil lies in the details because in some sectors we may be much more dependent on Russia than we think we are. Thank you. Andre, would you, would, can I come to you, given that you were an economic advisor to, to presidents, what's your view, if, can we get, move the microphone across? about, uh, as I can't get to Dimitri, uh, your view as to whether sanctions are having an economic impact, are having a personal impact, are in any way impacting on the view from the Kremlin of the way to respond to what is happening in Ukraine. First of all, uh, the, the general reaction in Russia and in Kremlin was the attack. Microphone, please. Okay. Closer. Closer. Do you hear me right now? No. Now, okay. Yeah. Uh, the first reaction in uh, Russian society and Kremlin towards the sanctions is just laughing. They consider it a joke. It's absolutely not serious. Uh, nobody's taking this seriously. Certainly, so, they're playing is the game. Is it not affecting them in any way? No, no. Even it's, it's, no, no. Some people, the kind of third level or some kind of fourth level, it's it's not serious. Um, and just comparing to the uh, their objectives, you're always asking about objectives. Concern, comparing to the objective that Kremlin has in mind, all the sanctions, all possible losses is incomparable. It's it just, it's impossible to compare. So that is why they're trying to play the game that uh, the sanctions, they're not happy with sanctions, and that is why they're always some kind of uh, promising uh, counter sanctions, but in reality, they do not bother them uh, much. It's a first. Second, um, you're asking all sides about objectives. And that is why when uh, the West or European Union or US or whoever uh, are trying to implement sanctions, you need to think about objectives. What is objectives of sanctions of any other actions? Sanctions is only technology, only the methods. It's not an objective. You need to think what you would like to achieve. If the objective is to make a pain to a bear, and if you'd like to poke him into the paw, okay, it will be painful for the bear, but the reaction of the bear would be quite different from you would expect. So that is why you need to think what you would like to achieve. If, for example, as the minister said, okay, the, one of the objectives, not the final one, would be the, to restore territorial integrity of Ukraine 
and to some kind of to withdraw Russian troops from Crimea and the, uh, Lugansk and Donetsk regions, you, you would need to think whether sanctions, especially those that have been thought right now, would be able to bring those results or not. And objective analysis would give you straight answer immediately. Definitely well, me, not. Well, let me ask the ministers, do you have clarity of why you voted for sanctions and what they're meant to achieve? <laughs> well, that's, that's a really good question. That's what I'm I here for. What do you want to achieve? Uh, well, I think that what we want to achieve and why actually we use sanctions is really to change behavior. I think that's, that's a really tool, not, uh, not something else. And uh, what we want to see is certainly to have Russia change its uh, behavior in uh, East Ukraine to get it, uh, to get it uh, more cooperative. However, I have to say here that we are talking a lot about sanctions, and I agree with, uh, with everything that has been said about uh, them. But we also have to remember that uh, some of steps we have to take. For instance, I still think that arms embargo, new technology embargo, would be something we have to use is also in our own interest in our own credibility. I cannot imagine, for instance, a situation where we have a Mistral ship called Sevastopol entering Sevastopol Harbor somewhere next uh, year. I think that's going to be a real credibility test. Second thing which we probably haven't talked here, uh, and we have tasked now European Commission, but I think uh, we should work a little bit quicker on this, it's not recognition uh, policy what it really means. For instance, discouraging EU businesses to invest in Crimea, to have uh, uh, Schengen visas issued to Crimean uh, citizens only in Kiev and so on. I think that those are not sanctions, but those are practical steps can, how we can also sustain our non-recognition policy beyond uh, only just uh, conclusions and uh, policy we have, we have actually made. So I think that uh, we still uh, have some room uh, for, for sanctions. I still think that we should be Despite what we've just heard there. Uh, yes, because uh, frankly, uh, if uh, there is no impact, uh, then if we see this uh, total breakup of international order post-1989 <coughs> at least, and I think the consequences uh, and my country has already some history and some resemblance of history of uh, Soviet occupation of 1940, then I think that if we don't impact that, then consequence for the whole Europe could be, uh, in the long term, much, much uh, graver. Tim, I'm, I know you have to leave shortly to go to Kiev, and we're half an hour late, so can you just bear with me one moment, because I, I think Dimitri does have an answer to the question um, and can join us somehow. Um, Dimitri, can you hear me? If not, uh, can you just say what you were going to say in answer to the question of uh, what are the intentions uh, in Russia at the moment? Are you able to hear me, Dimitri? The <laughs> uh, line hmm. was cut off. All right. Uh, we will try again, but can you hear me one more time, Dimitri? Yes or no? He's sending me an email now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so Tim, uh, given that you are go about to go to Kiev, um, again, this point about, uh, about uh, the leverage and the pressure uh, on Moscow mm -hmm. from the view of the European Union and the international community, not all the international community. What's your view about the impact or non-impact or whether there's a degree of self-delusion about the likely impact of these kind of measures? Right, well, I mean, I think it's important to ignore what everyone says about sanctions because we just don't know how kind of significant they are. I mean, obviously, when, you, when you're sanctioned yourself, you say, oh, great, I'm never going to take vacation in Siberia slash Texas anyway, right? Obviously, you laugh it off, but I, I don't think we know how significant it is. I do think that it's important as a way for Europeans and Americans to have a policy which has a name. I do think it's important as a way for providing some level of moral clarity. I would, I would repose the question a little bit and ask what the present situation allows the European Union to do which would be in its interest anyway, which, which would function like sanctions but go beyond sanctions, and there are two pretty obvious answers. One of them is law enforcement. The European Union has a problem with the rule of law, which 
uh, has been helpfully revealed in the last few months with the help of Ukrainian and Russian citizens, right? It turns out that many of the practices inside the previous regime in Ukraine and the current regime in Russia are only possible because of the rule of law in European Union member states. And, and, and that rule of law is in turn perverted and mutilated by these practices. So you have an opportunity for simple law enforcement, which would probably be a very good thing for the European Union and would inflict pain here and there by the way, incidentally. The second opportunity has to do with something which, which um, Prime Minister Tusk has already proposed, which is to have a common energy policy. And, and since I'm not a, a member of government and don't have to stay within what's reasonable or possible or likely, I would say you can go much further than that. This is like 9-11 like in the US where we totally failed. This is an opportunity for an energy revolution. This is an opportunity for the European Union to triple investment in fusion in photovoltaics, in clean fission, and in energy technologies, which are actually realizable in the next 10, 15 years. That won't hurt Putin right now, but if successful, like if you actually achieved fusion in 15 years, this discussion would be totally irrelevant in the future, right? You could just make this all go away. Not now, but you could do something now, which is double fusion budgets or triple fusion budgets, which would make us make it certain that in 15 years we wouldn't be meeting here and having this discussion. In 9-11, we had the opportunity for an energy revolution in the US, and we did the opposite. We just drilled. Mm -hmm. We just fracked. This, too, is an argument for drilling and fracking. And there will be plenty of drilling and fracking in western Ukraine, in Poland, in the middle of my country, lots of earthquakes, lots of poisoned waters. Terrific. I understand the reasons for it. It's going to happen. It will have some effect. But we could think a little bit bigger. If you replace hydrocarbons substantially, then this threat just goes away completely. So, I mean, while there's still some time and some political momentum, maybe we could think about that. Tim, just before you dash for the plane, yeah. you're a professor of history. Um, what about what uh, the Deputy Prime Minister said earlier, which reflects what a lot of people uh, are saying now? This is a wake-up call. We were too complacent. Um, we were... Uh, we, were, we took too much for granted. In other words, we've entered a new period, which is not the normative period that was assumed to be the case mm -hmm. up until a few weeks or months ago. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, what one, I mean to, 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 to turn it around a little bit, one should give um, the Russian leadership credit for having developed a new international ideology of social conservatism where they are seeking to play on worldwide, not just Russian, European, or Ukrainian opposition to certain issues like same-sex marriage. One should give them credit for having a vision called Eurasia of how to destroy the European Union. One should give them credit for making substantial ideological advances over the course of 2013. In 2014, we are seeing those ideolo ideological advances translated into policy. So, yes, we are in a new world. That new world was already there in ideology and on television screens, for those of us who are paying attention, by the last quarter of 2013. Now it's obviously present in politics. I think it's not surprising that the European Union failed to notice this. Not everyone spends four hours every night watching Russian television, but if you do, it will change your life. It will change your life if you do that. Um, uh, if you're not already doing it, of course, um, in which case it won't. Um, but I'm not, it's not surprising because the, 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 the hard shift in Russian ideology and policy really had very little to do with the European Union. It had to do with dynamics inside, inside Russia itself. But there is something qualitatively new. It's ambitious, it's coherent, and it obviously demands some kind of response. And do you think the political class have now understood that? No, 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 no. I think you've taken the first baby steps towards understanding it. Yeah, but it's much, much worse than you First think. baby steps. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Do you have to leave? I've got to go. All right. I'm Can sorry I... we're running late, but thank you very much it's for your contribution. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Let me move to... Uh... Yeah. Thanks. Just... Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. Tim, safe flight. Let me. Tim, uh, I don't want. Could, could I just from, introduce uh, you, uh, Lord Reed? Lord yeah. John Reed, former uh, Defence Secretary and uh, Home uh, uh, Home Secretary, Interior Minister in Britain, uh, uh, and now a principal in the Chertov Group. Thank you for the invitation here. Uh, I suppose, actually, Tim would have been the person to address this question too. But I wonder if my colleagues would like to comment uh, on the internal dynamics of the European Union populations in terms of support for any decisions taken. Uh, I should declare an interest when we're talking about federal structures and existing states. I'm not only within the Anglo-Saxon orbit, 
but I'm actually a Scotsman, so I'm a Celt, <laughs> and just about to take part in a debate about whether Scotland should separate from the United Kingdom. And your answer is? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my answer is clearly no. I disagree with the First Minister of Scotland. I also disagree with him, incidentally, when he expressed admiration for President Putin recently, and he's been backtracking on that uh, ever since. But my question is this. Given the internal growth, particularly in Western Europe, of anti-European, anti-EU, Euroscepticism, uh, and indeed right-wing nationalist parties, to what extent is that <coughs> undermining uh, the political leadership in, taping, in taking robust steps in responding to what might be perceived as Russian aggression in, in the Ukraine? Uh, because, of course, political leaders are bound ultimately in democracies by carrying their people with them. Uh, and you will be aware that particularly in Western Europe, and Northwestern Europe, not just the UK, there is the growth of a degree of scepticism about the, the powers uh, and the, the progress of the direction of the European Union, which is quite different from Central Europe and, and many Eastern European peoples. Do you believe, uh, I was actually wanting to ask Tim about that because he had commented earlier about the difficulties in carrying people with them. But is that something that, that has appeared to you to be an element in any way in the reluctance to go perhaps as far as some of you would have wanted in, in being assertive against the, uh, the Russians? Well, I, I would agree that uh, the uh, challenge is not just uh, the uh, let's say, controversies or different approaches uh, among member states, but also European public opinion is very much divided. And we have to be aware of that. And we have to tackle this problem. And mention has already been made uh, that there are very close ties between the extreme right parties in Europe, everywhere, by the way, Central Europe, Western Europe, doesn't make a difference, which is quite interesting. Uh, so between the extreme right and, uh, and, 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 uh, and Russia. But this is not limited. I would say the pro-Russian feelings are not limited to the extreme right. And there must be a reason for that, which is not an easy question to answer. But that's why we also discussed it in the Foreign Affairs Council. One of the factors, no doubt, is, is a huge and robust and partially successful propaganda, no doubt. And uh, you hear the view uh, from many very reasonable people that, uh, after all, uh, Ukraine should not become an EU member. Uh, Ukraine should not become a NATO member. Why to irritate the Russians? And when you answer that, look, perhaps this should be decided by the Ukrainians themselves, then, okay, yes, but. So I think this is a, this is a, this is a real challenge. I uh, wouldn't disagree with that. And uh, that's why uh, I think that um, some more information uh, should, be, should be given. And there are differences among the member states, uh, but I uh, think these feelings uh, in many important member states are widespread uh, and, uh, I would say, deep-rooted. Let me go to back to Oleg, uh, because we have about 10 minutes to run before the Assistant Secretary joins us. Um, Oleg, just picking up on what Tim said, baby steps at the moment from the European Union and the political class. How are you viewing the capability now of the, those outside who are trying to support the Ukrainian position, uh, their ability to act, um, the wisdom of their choice of, uh, of policy, and also their wisdom of, in analysis of what's happening in your country? Uh, I feel that we are kind of pilot case where EU is really learning how to counteract to some new challenges, because when I remember when I was discussing with many ministers, absolute necessity of personal financial sanctions because before bloodshed uh, happened in Maidan, before they started killing people, because I was in international banking, I know that it is possible. You have financial services, you have your own direction, uh, intelligence, you do know what was 
missing what we call political will. So I was told it's absolutely impossible. Now what we are learning, that EU is learning. EU, US, Canadian, even Israelis financial services, my impression is that they have certain data bank or uh, informational map where they start enjoying the tracking of uh, <coughs> dirty money. And if EU follows, I agree here with, uh, I don't remember who said, you stick to your law, law enforcement, probably Timothy said this, uh, uh, that, that is the, the, the immediate re response of EU. If you try to implement your own policy to prevent dirty money uh, enjoying, to, 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 to stop having our crooks as VIP clients of your bank, then immediately there is immediate effect. You, you can feel the difference. But also EU is learning how to respond to broader, broader uh, uh, challenge. What Andre was talking about sanctions, my feeling is sometimes EU leaders feel personally challenged by Mr. Putin's, uh, well, very, uh, I would say, irresponsible behavior. And therefore, us as Ukrainians, we hear a clear message. But okay, we understand there are this period of concern, grave concern, very grave concern, gravest concern is gone. EU has and US has prepared or developed this uh, set of personal sanctions. But we came very close to so-called third level of sanctions, which is named at economic sectors. And whatever they speak here, I remember British uh, Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs saying that Britain is prepared, and this considering the possibility to use financial sectors. Chancellor Merkel was talking about possibility of using sanctions in energy sector, but the key issue is when, and we understand when. And EU is here, the way we understand it in Ukraine, EU made it very clear that if Mr. Putin would try to directly invade Ukraine, cross the border with his uh, peacekeepers or whatever, or if he would try to disrupt very brutally presidential elections. That was publicly stated, and for me it is a certain benchmark which was before missing. I was always asking, where are those red lines crossing which you get a uh, tougher, tough, 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 tougher response? And my feeling is that uh, technically both EU, US, probably some other countries are preparing for this. Maybe they're not yet ready, but they made a clear statement, because if they don't deliver, soft power of EU is just simply gone. It means that what Andre said, if this is uh, really understood in Moscow exactly that you can ignore all the sanctions, that uh, what we are doing here, what we are discussing, what is EU soft power, what we are signing with EU, what we are thinking about as NATO, what is Article 5's meaning, and you can go on and on with this. Thank you. Um, I do have the outcome of Dimitri sitting at his keyboard a few minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. he, he has given me a written reply, no webcam, no voice, but if you're hearing us, Dimitri, thank you. Quote, it, I think it should be clear. At minimum, Russia wants to see a Ukraine that stays away from NATO, has Russian as official language alongside Ukrainian, and adds an elite component through gubernatorial legislative elections in the regions, accountable to, this is where it gets a bit murky uh, in Kremlin. terms of the, to the, Rus the Russian, the Russo-Hone voters of the southeast. Is that the way you're seeing it, foreign ministers, as the minimum position of Russia? Minister well, Rinkevich. Well, uh, I do think that, uh, but of course, uh, any answer here can be correct. I do think that uh, still the objective of, of Russia is to do everything possible to keep Ukraine uh, as unstable as possible through whatever it means, through whatever it takes. Uh, I really don't believe, or I can be spectacularly wrong if uh, things change, that there is an idea of annexation of further territories of Ukraine on the table. I still think that Crimea is going to cost uh, quite a lot. But at the same time, um, I think also that the key currently is, first of all, uh, for Russia, the key goal is, first of all, to prevent Ukraine from in their opinion, drifting towards whatever European perspective Western. there is. Uh, that's one. And second, I still think that we have to address also another goal, Eurasian Union. Uh, I think that we are, in a way, uh, confronting a kind of attempts to recreate something in between of Russian empire of 
19th century and Soviet Union of 20th century as much as possible. And from that point of view, I think that whatever uh, works to undermine also our own uh, unity in EU and also in NATO, by the way, it will be uh, used and it will be on the table. And we have to be prepared to very different scenarios in very different parts of, of the world. We have talked about Ukraine. Let's look at Kazakhstan. Let's look at Central Asia. Let's look at uh, some other parts. Oleg, uh, particularly that last part. And by the way, if you've got points you want to raise with the Assistant Secretary and you'd like to use your uh, Spot Me uh, um, pad, please do it now because we have 20 minutes with her when she arrives shortly. So get them on the agenda now, those points you'd like to raise, um, if you can, please. That particular point about adding an elite component through gubernatorial legislative elections in the regions accountable to the Russian home voters of the southeast. Well, it's very vague, let's say, say it. In but there's a direction of travel which is clear. Yeah, uh, but my, my first remark, I heard it exactly 10 years ago that, oh, we don't want you to go to NATO because NATO is hostile, but we would welcome if you decide to go to EU. My answer at that time was, you are saying this because 10 years ago, EU perspective was very vague, but as soon as it becomes realistic, we heard unprecedented hysteria when we were ready to sign agreement with EU. So I'm not buying this argument that, oh, no NATO, but to EU, you are welcomed. This is, this is absolutely, this is already time proven uh, lies. As for the that last remark, what Russia is trying to say that Russia would like to, to be more Ukrainian than Ukrainians. They would like to see Ukraine whole and united. So we will hear all the regions represented there. The problem of today's government is very simple. Uh, who does represent interest of this eastern and southern uh, parts of Ukraine? Uh, the, the ousted president who run, run away in disgrace and, and his comrades in the party who are now uh, find, found out to be just uh, paranoid, per, paranoid uh, corrupted officials. They, they disappeared and there are no new faces. Should you talk to colonel of, of Russian uh, intelligence who calls himself commander in chief of Netsky, who is representing now south and east? What my, what we try to do to tell uh, Ukrainians, we are saying, okay, listen, we have one way to delegate somebody. This is election. Let's have presidential elections. And I understand here, they don't have their own candidate. But come on, this happens. So Yanukovych was not my candidate, but he was a president. You can't elect candidate who, who is president, who is happy with everyone. But we have parliamentary presidential elections. We are going to have parliamentary elections. So elect your elite. Just send, delegate somebody, but don't give this uh, right to represent Ukrainians to colonels who, who, call, who are Russians, uh, who came from Crimea, who are professional special operations officers, and with them we are supposed to uh, discuss uh, interests of, of, of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. This is not serious. All right, Oleg, thank you very much indeed. Is anyone burning to say something, please? Uh, yeah, let, let's get the microphone down here because I'm conscious of the need for balance in this discussion, even though it's been a bit uh, tested. We've got literally three minutes, so can you keep to one minute each? This isn't the end of the discussion of Ukraine here at GlobeSec, so it's the beginning of a series of discussions, particularly with those arriving tomorrow. Can we get the microphone, a microphone over there, please, and we'll come to you in a moment. Can you be swift, please? Okay, may I offer a translation of Dmitry's words, uh, Dmitry's words on Russians or Mr. Putin's intentions towards Ukraine? In simple words, uh, Mr. Putin says, either Ukraine should be under myself, under Mr. Putin, or Ukraine should not exist as independent sovereign state. <laughs> Thank you. Could you move the microphone to your right, please? <laughs> okay. Alain Dretro from uh, Three Day Spain and uh, Brussels. Uh, if what we heard this afternoon is true, and particularly Timothy Snyder's assessment that there is a will not only to destroy Ukraine, or at least to keep Ukraine as unstable as possible, but also to tackle the EU unity and NATO unity, I'd like to ask the two ministers, of course the sanctions taken by the European Union today have been as soft as possible towards ourselves. Do you think that it is possible to stop a, a country that is now engaged in a journey like this, with its own public opinion heated up to go to war if necessary, without making any sacrifices on our sides. Basically, do you think we can con continue with, with sanctions that does not imply sacrifices for the EU? 
Hold that for the one moment. Last point. Uh, Charles Gatti, Johns Hopkins University, Washington. Uh, I may be the only person in the room who would ask this question, but I have, some, uh, I have a question about what countries in the European Union, perhaps you can ask the panel to reply no, to this. No, you can ask what them. Can, okay, <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. You see the trap. Uh, uh, <laughs> what countries support sanctions and which countries don't? And which ones are... All right, let, let's try it the other way. Uh, which, in between. Which countries don't support sanctions? Well, you believe those are less numbers. Even though there's unity. <laughs> Uh, in true spirit of unity, I will not reveal that uh, <laughs> list. Um, but uh, let me just very quickly to come back to, to, to one very important issue, which I think is very, very uh, challenging. Uh, European Union and most of our countries just went through very difficult economic and financial crisis. And I think that has changed uh, a lot in also in kind of thinking of publics. Uh, my own country lost about 19% of GDP back in 2009. However, we have been always sometimes a little bit skeptical about any unions, be it Soviet Union or European Union as a public. However, the current events uh, have shown that uh, some support, some uh, kind of understanding belonging to EU is growing. My biggest concern currently is that really in upcoming European Parliament elections we will get uh, quite a, a great victory to some extent, not in, let's say, absolute numbers, but quite a great victory for right-wing extremist parties, which actually really are happy with uh, what Timothy Snyder has said, social conservatism. You know, um, uh, in Russia, they spent about 24 hours talking about uh, winner of Eurovision. Almost every politician was uh, kind of finding the necessity to comment on that. So from that point of view, uh, I think we have to address more fundamental issue uh, also within European Union, how we are going to move uh, with some institutional reform and not so much probably worry whether we are still in the sanction phase number two or we are going to sanction phase number three. Okay. I think here, uh, here we will be working and uh, actually it's right, we have some benchmarks now set. Uh, what would be a good uh, reason to get back to discussion and imposing Minister, sanctions? Minister, literally with, 15 seconds yeah. because we have to move on to but, the assistance But here sector. I think that it's more fundamental problem also when it comes to Ukraine, also how we are dealing with our EU internal challenges than actually how we are dealing with another set of uh, sanctions or list of countries that probably are not Quickly. so supportive. Uh, very briefly. Uh, I'm not sure that the measures that have been taken until now uh, have been or are completely fruitless. Second, uh, instead of asking the question which country supports or which country is against the sanctions, I would uh, say that uh, there could be a discussion where the red line is put. So, uh, you know the problem with red lines, by the way. But uh, we all agree that there is such a thing as a red line uh, after that, uh, we have to turn to the so-called phase three, what we call targeted measures, after all, economic sanctions. So, uh, number three, very briefly, uh, for the objectives, uh, I understand these are the concrete, uh, let's say, demands, but uh, at the bottom of the whole process, I believe that there is a fundamental objective, and this is to rebuild a lost uh, uh, empire because it was traumatic, it's a, also a psychological phenomenon, not just uh, geopolitical or geoeconomic. It's about prestige, it's about national pride, uh, it's about recovering uh, the traumatism uh, of, uh, of, uh, of losing an empire. That is at the bottom of, of the whole thank process. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much indeed. Both Ministers, thank you, Oleg, and also Tim Snyder. Thank you very much indeed. I know we've overrun dramatically, uh, but it's been rich so far, a takeoff for the next stage of discussion on Ukraine. Thank you for all the messages and also your interventions, and thank you to the panel as well, and Assistant Secretary. Not Let's, easy uh, to be the Minister, do it. but... Quick change. You did. <laughs> Stay here for tonight.